Unity is a primary concern of any leader of a local church. If the unity of the local church is being undermined, it follows that the witness of that church to the, to the community would also be damaged. Further, it hampers the advancement of the ministry. So you could just imagine the Apostle Paul when he learned that there were schisms and divisions in the church that he planted in Corinth. He immediately wrote in order to address this issue. Just so that we would understand what was going on, turn your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 3 to 4. The Apostle Paul tells there, You are still worldly, for since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? Are you not acting like mere humans? For when one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, are you not mere human beings? What was going on here? Uh, well, uh, there were factions in the church, and these factions idolized certain leaders. We might call these groups as fans club. Uh, some people form their fans club in support of their own preferred leader. Now, the Apostle Paul wrote to say, this is worldly, this is sinful. You should never compare pastors. You should never have a, a, an exalted view of human leaders. This goes against the very word of God. Only Jesus Christ should have the place of preeminence. And so, after telling his readers, his Corinthian readers in chapter 3, verses 1 to 4, that it is sinful and worldly to have an exalted view of their leaders. He continues on in verses 5 to 15 uh, by saying that this is the proper way to view your leaders. Paul tells them uh, this is the biblical way of viewing your church leaders. Uh, the first part, verses 5 to 9, we've already covered in the previous sermon. For today, we will be covering verses 10 to 15. Allow me to read that passage to you. By the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as a wise builder, and someone else is building on it. But each one should build with care, for no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. If anyone builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, their work will be shown for what it is, because the day will bring it to light, it will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each person's work. If what has been built survives, the builder will receive a reward. If it is burned up, the builder will suffer loss, but yet will be saved, even though only as one escaping through the flames. I've entitled this sermon as Mere Servants of the Master. In the preceding passage, the Apostle Paul introduces to us two analogies uh, for Christian ministry. The first analogy is that of farming. He compares Christian ministry to that of farming. And the second one is that of constructing a building. Let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 6 to 8, 
And as I have mentioned, the Apostle Paul uses the illustration of farming. He says this, I planted the seed. Apollos watered it, but God made it grow. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. The man who plants and the man who waters have one purpose, and each will be rewarded according to his own labor. Isn't that a wonderful illustration of church ministry, that of farming? And the idea here being conveyed by the Apostle Paul is that each of us uh, has his own task in this farming enterprise. Huh? Uh, some, some would uh, plant the seed, others would water. We are privileged to participate in this endeavor. But bear in mind, it is God who causes the growth. The Apostle Paul emphasizes here that the one who plants and the one who, who waters is not anything. I mean, he is nothing compared to God who causes the growth. The point being, do not exalt the workers. Now he turns to another analogy. The analogy of constructing the building. Verse 9 seems to be a transition point. Let me read that. He says, For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field, God's building. There you go. He transitions from the analogy of farming to that of building a, uh, a building, a structure. From this point on, from verse 10, church ministry is compared to a large building project. And in this analogy, our Lord is constructing His church. And this has begun way, way back huh, in the first century when the foundations were laid. Now, I have to remind everyone that ultimately, the Lord Jesus Christ is the builder of the church. Isn't it in Matthew chapter 16, the Lord Jesus tells His disciples, He promises them, I will build my church. So He's the builder. But our passage tells us, He reveals to us, the Apostle Paul, that we are God's fellow workers. Another way of putting it is that we are partners with the Lord Jesus Christ. Ah, such a privileged position, isn't it? To be working with the Master, working with Jesus Christ. Now, certainly He does not need us, but He sovereignly chose to use us to work in and through us in order to accomplish his divine purpose. But again, this is not a cause to exalt the worker. We are simply tools being used by the Master. Let's look at the example of the Apostle Paul, the example of the servant. The Apostle Paul begins verse 10 by saying, by the grace God has given me. I love that. Uh, that's a statement of humility, isn't it? What he was saying was this. This servant was given a unique role to fulfill. And he played this role faithfully. You see, the Apostle Paul was called to be an apostle to the Gentiles. Now understand this. This was a role that was not his choice. He did not pursue to become an apostle of Jesus Christ. In fact, he was an enemy of the cross. He was going out of his way to pursue 
Christians in order to persecute them. So this position, this role that was given to him was not his choice. It was a privilege given to him by God. If we would apply this to our own situations, we too have unique roles to play. And get this, all these roles are by the grace of God. We cannot boast about anything. For these roles have come by way of God's sovereign choice. You see, at times, our roles can get to our heads, right? Uh, we think that we hold on to a particular position in the church uh, because we are good, we are competent, we are skilled. Uh, God must have looked upon us with favor and granted us these roles because of our skill or our goodness. Not so. All these have come by way of God's grace. The gifts, the gifts, the spiritual gifts that we have, well, they are not ours, but they originated from God. Uh, the energy and the resources that we use in order to operate these gifts, uh, so that we can function effectively, well, the energy comes from Him, not from us. And so in that statement, what the Apostle Paul was saying, don't exalt me, don't exalt the servant. I am simply here fulfilling such a position by the grace of God. He continues, he continues by saying, I laid a foundation as a wise builder. His role as an apostle is to lay the foundation of the church. That's the role of an apostle. You see, in constructing a building of prime importance is the foundation. Any structure, any edifice, no matter how beautiful it may be, huh? it is of no good if the foundation is weak. And Paul makes it clear here in our passage that the foundation that he laid huh, in this, of uh, the foundation of this structure uh, that the Lord Jesus Christ is building is that of himself. Jesus Christ is the foundation of this structure that we call the church. Now, don't misunderstand. The church is not a structure. In fact, the church is people. But he is simply using this analogy in order to describe the church. The foundation of this temple, of this building, is the Lord Jesus Christ. For instance, the foundation is the person of Christ. The fact that He is truly God and truly man. The church is not founded upon any other human being. It is founded on Christ's person and no one else. Huh? The church is founded on the accomplishments of Jesus Christ. His death, His uh, resurrection, His mediatorial work as He has ascended up unto heaven. Everything that He has accomplished, that's the foundation of the church. The teachings of Jesus Christ, uh, uh, as he taught them in the Gospels and uh, commented, explained to us in an expanded way in the epistles. All these point to Jesus Christ. These are the teachings upon which the church is built upon. And everything is laid out in Scripture, isn't it? Everything in the Bible points to Jesus Christ. And the Apostle Paul, 
ha? says that he is a wise builder. Another way of putting it is an expert builder. Someone who really knows what he's doing. He knows his craft. Now, we might think that Paul is boasting here about his abilities, but he was not. Because this servant did not operate according to the world's wisdom, but he, was, he operated according to God's wisdom. And this he emphasized in the previous passage in chapter 2. Verses 1 to 2. Let me bring you back to that passage. He says in verse 1, When I came to you, I did not come with eloquence or human wisdom, as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. Verse 2, For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you, except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Now, let me jump to verses 4 to 5. He continues on by saying, My message and my preaching were not with the wise, not with wise and persuasive words, no, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power, so that your faith might not rest on human wisdom, but on God's power. What the Apostle Paul was trying to emphasize here in this passage is that the wisdom that he used was not the one which he gained from the world. It did not come from his ingenuity, but this wisdom came from God. In other words, Paul had nothing to boast about. He had nothing to boast about. That speaks of the humility of the Apostle Paul. He continues with his statement, and someone else is building on it. Don't you love that? What he was saying was this servant huh, recognized other believers' roles, and he utilized them in order to advance the cause of Jesus Christ. Huh? The Apostle Paul knew that he was merely a servant uh, with a role to fulfill. And he knew when that role ended. He also was willing to turn over the ministry uh, when he sensed that his role was done. Such was the humility of the Apostle Paul. In the case of the church in Corinth, the next person who would build upon his work was that of Apollos. Apollos built on what the Apostle Paul had started. In effect, we are all simply servants of Jesus Christ. Yes, we are privileged to partner with Him in the advancement of the kingdom cause. But there is nothing in us that we can boast of. And this is something, huh? uh, this is how we ought to view our leaders in the church. Uh, this is a, uh, a mindset that we ought to maintain. Uh, yes, we highly regard our leaders. Yes, we love them. We submit to their authority, don't we? But we should not exceedingly exalt them. That is the position of Jesus Christ. And so, from the example of the servant, we now come to the exhortation of the servant. Paul continues by saying, But each one should build with care. For no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, I want us all to understand what the Apostle Paul is saying. 
He admonishes us. He admonishes all those who will build upon the foundation that He has laid to be extra careful. What does that mean? It means that we start off with Jesus Christ, but we continue on building with Jesus Christ. In other words, while Christ is the foundation, the starting point, we never leave Jesus Christ, do we? Everything in ministry revolves around Jesus Christ. Everything. We proclaim Christ, don't we? Jesus Christ is the centerpiece of our preaching and teaching. His person. His accomplishments. In prayer, the church relies on Jesus Christ. We worship Jesus Christ. We, we seek to exalt Jesus Christ. Someone has said, if ministry were to be summed up, ministry is simply pointing people to Jesus Christ. We point to His supremacy. His preeminence, worship Him. He is the supreme God. We point to His sufficiency, trust in Him, rely on Him. Now, if you would observe, there are ministries that begin with Jesus Christ. They were able to lay down the right foundation, that of the person of Christ. But then it seems that they build upon uh, that foundation with something else. For instance, uh, some ministries revolve around a particular personality, a strong figurehead. And everything revolves around him. That's quite dangerous, isn't it? We point people not to Christ, but to depend upon that strong character. Many times when these leaders die or when these leaders leave, the whole ministry crumbles because the ministry has revolved around this personality. Sometimes we build upon the foundation uh, by using Secular means, huh? uh, marketing strategies and knowledge. We make use of, uh, of worldly leadership skills. That's what we use in order to build upon the foundation. Even if the starting point is Jesus Christ, we ought to continue on with Christ. Which... Uh, leads me to this warning. Be wary of those uh, leaders who seek to exalt themselves and who seem to be building, building their own kingdoms, not the kingdom of Jesus Christ. Be wary also of those who create factions that revolve around certain people. At times, uh, we tend to rally others to follow this leader or that, that leader. Uh, this will not contribute to the unity of the church. The church ought to revolve around Jesus Christ. Everything in ministry proceeds from Christ and ultimately finds its concluding end in Christ. Be careful, as the Lord will not treat kindly those who destroy His church. Now let's look at the examination of the servant. We continue on reading the passage. In verse 12, it says, if anyone builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, stop there for a while. Paul continues on with his analogy, the analogy of constructing a building. 
And he speaks upon constructing upon the foundation which is Jesus Christ. Just like when we are constructing a building, we make use of various materials. And in the same way, in, in, in ministry, we build upon the foundation of Jesus Christ with various materials as well. The first three materials we see are valuable materials, aren't they? which speaks about the value you know, of what we do for Jesus Christ's sake. These are gold, silver, precious stones. More than just being valuable, notice also that these materials are durable. They are, in fact, fire-resistant. If the building is engulfed in flames, uh, while it may dissolve, disintegrate the other materials, these materials would last the fire, right? They are not highly combustible materials. Now, what is Paul saying? He is talking about works that are done out of reliance on Jesus Christ. Huh? When we do things out of our faith, out of our, our trust in Christ, these are ministries that are done to highlight who He is and what Jesus had accomplished. These are activities in the church that truly strengthen the spiritual lives of believers. When we minister through the Word, when we lead people to trust in Jesus Christ and offer their lives, consecrate their lives to Him, these are the things that truly strengthen the body of Jesus Christ. These are gold, silver, precious stones. Now notice the next three. Huh? They are of little value, wood, hay, or straw. Imagine that, you know. Further, they are highly combustible materials. Huh? Uh, you pass them through the fire and everything disintegrates. And Paul was, uh, was conveying the idea that these are our accomplishments, uh, our accomplishments that are built on worldly ideas. Uh, accomplishments built upon the traditions of men. Ministries that are done not to highlight Jesus Christ, not to bring glory and honor to Jesus Christ, but out of selfish gain. Notice what the Corinthian believers were building upon the foundation that was laid by Paul. They were teaching worldly ideas. Uh, they were putting individuals, human servants, in an exalted position. They were teaching pagan ideas and fusing them with Christian ideas. Huh? And together with paganism, immorality also uh, comes, uh, comes with it. Uh, uh, immorality and paganism were entering the body of Jesus Christ. These are the things upon which these Corinthian believers were building on Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul leaves them with this, uh, with this warning. He tells them in verse 13, their work will be shown for what it is because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire and the fire will test the quality of each person's work. The Apostle Paul reveals here that there will come a time of judgment, a time of expose, meaning to say our works will be revealed for its worth. 
Now you heard me right. There will come a time of judgment for believers. Now, this is not the judgment that will decide heaven or hell. No, we are saved, aren't we? We are safely secure in the hands of Jesus Christ. But notice, this is a judgment for reward's sake. And it says here, all our works would pass through the fire. Everything, all of our accomplishments, things that we think are of substantial value, they would pass through the fire. Ah, we may be proud of these, uh, these achievements, but God will let it pass through the fire. And if they are of substantial value, if they are of eternal value, then they would not disintegrate. But if these were done, uh, founded on, on hay, wood, and, uh, and straw or stubble, then it would burn up. And we may, we may be surprised, this may come as a shock to us, that the things that we think are valuable uh, would be proven worthless in the eyes of God. And then we read lastly in verses 14 to 15, if what has been built survives, the builder will receive a reward. There you go. Ver verse 15, if it is burned up, the builder will suffer loss, but yet will be saved, even though only as one escaping through the flames. When judgment comes and believers come face to face with the supreme master, Jesus Christ, all our works done for the glory and honor of our King and the advancement of His kingdom would certainly be rewarded. But those that had no contribution whatsoever to the advancement of the cause of the Master, they would receive no reward. Well, let me close with this. Let me just give you some closing thoughts. We are privileged to be God's fellow workers, huh? hand in hand with Jesus in advancing the kingdom cause. We thank Him for this wonderful privilege. We applaud those who are faithful in their service to God. We even express our admiration we have a high regard for those serving in leadership roles, such as our pastors, our leaders in the church. But let us all be reminded that we are mere servants of the Lord. We dare not exalt ourselves or even others to a position that only Jesus Christ deserves. It is only Jesus who deserves preeminence in His church. And a last thought, the unity of the body of Jesus Christ ought to be a primary concern for the people of God. We attain unity when we put Jesus in His rightful preeminent position.